doctors are operating to remove what they think is a giant tumor on a man who looks nine months pregnant. But when they cut him open, they are horrified by what they find inside. I put my hand inside and to my surprise and horror, I could shake hands with somebody inside. Deep inside Sanjay Kumar is the body of his twin brother, a half-formed baby that has lain inside him as a parasite for 36 years. Sanjay's story is shocking, but every twin pregnancy is fraught with danger. His case is the extreme end of a range of conditions that affect twins in the womb. All too often, the journey from conception to birth may be a battle, a battle that can end in death. To find myself pregnant was like a page out of a fairy tale. It was amazing. I went into hospital, saw a doctor was on call, and his exact words were, I'm afraid that's it, it's over. You're gonna have to have a, what amounts to a termination. May 1999, the city of Nagpur in India. On a hot summer night, 36-year-old Sanjay Kumar is rushed to hospital. His stomach is so swollen he looks nine months pregnant and he can barely breathe. Doctors think he has a giant tumor and decide to operate to remove it immediately. Basically, the size of the tumor was so big that uh, it was uh, pressing on his diaphragm and that's why he was very breathless. Surgeons prepare to operate. They know they're facing a dangerous task, but are unaware of the full scale of the horror they're dealing with. Because of the sheer size of the tumor, it was a bit difficult and we anticipated a lot of problems. Dr. Mehta and his team begin to operate. Soon it becomes clear that they're not dealing with any tumor, but something far more horrifying. They cut into the mysterious lump and out gush gallons of pus to reveal a strange, almost human shape within. To my surprise and horror, I could shake hands with somebody inside. It was a bit shocking for me. He just put his hand inside and he said there, there are a lot of bones inside. First one limb came out and then another limb came out, then some part of genitalia, then some part of head, some limbs, uh, toes, nails, hair. Inside Sanjay's belly, is the half-formed body of an infant boy. Feet and hands were well developed. It had fingers and the nails also. Nails were quite long. We were horrified, we were confused and amazed. It is a baby and it has been growing inside Sanjay for 36 years. Even more shocking, this baby is the mutated body of Sanjay's twin brother. I knew there was something growing inside me, something very strange. The half-formed twin has been growing inside him, parasitically feeding off him, and sooner or later, it would have killed him. Sanjay had suffered one of the world's strangest medical conditions, where one fetus envelops and absorbs its twin inside the womb, called fetus in fetu. It occurs one in 500,000 deliveries and less than 90 cases as of today are reported in literature. Fetus in fetu comes about when early in pregnancy, one twin fetus wraps round and envelops the other. As the fetus then grows, what would have been its twin remains inside it, 
attaching its blood vessels to its host and feeding off it as a parasite. Normally, fetus in fetu is diagnosed in the womb or soon after birth. These days, with ultrasound technology, cases of fetus in fetu are usually detected very early on. This rare ultrasound scan shows a fetus inside an unborn baby while still in its mother's womb. Soon after the baby was delivered, doctors marked up the location of the fetus inside so they could operate to remove it. This is the sac the fetus in fetu was found in. And this is what the parasitic baby looked like when it was delivered from its identical twin. But Sanjay's case is unprecedented. Doctors were baffled as to how his parasitic twin could have gone undetected for as long as 36 years. When Sanjay Kumar was rushed to hospital in India in 1999, Doctors removed a half-formed body of a baby from inside his abdomen. It was his twin brother, and it had been growing inside him for all 36 years of his life. It's a rare condition known as fetus in fetu, and no other case has ever gone untreated for so long. To doctors, Sanjay's case may have been a medical miracle but it brought only shame and misery to him. He noticed the abnormality in his childhood. Say when he was seven, eight years old, he found that his tummy was not like his other brothers. Though he was very lean and thin, he had a protruded belly, but he never gave importance to that. Neither were, did they consult any doctor for that. They thought it is some, because it could be chubby child. As he grew older, his belly got bigger and bigger. People in the village where he lived made fun of him. They said he looked pregnant. People used to tease him. They used to tell that, well, uh, he looks like a pregnant lady. So he was mentally very depressed. When Sanjay came to hospital, he looked like he was about to give birth. But like a woman after labor, as soon as the baby was removed, the pain was lifted. Before the operation, life was very tough indeed, but now I'm much better. Actually, after operation, he was very much relieved because he was in a lot of agony, he was in distress, and he was not interested in uh, knowing what happened, what, what exactly uh, did doctor uh, take out from his abdomen. Although it was a baby, Sanjay's twin, like all fetus in fetu, was too underdeveloped to be viable it couldn't survive outside its host. Dr. Mehta wasted no time x-raying his monstrous discovery, fascinated to find out more. Now these are long bones. These are short bones. This is a femur and this is a humerus. And here you can see the bones. These are the bones, long bones. Here you can see the metatarsals and the toes, well-developed toes. Now here you can see fingers. This is a rudimentary head, rudimentary head. But even though he had been given a clean bill of health, there was no let up in the humiliation heaped on Sanjay. They still ridicule him. Now they say, yes, you went for an operation and you delivered the baby. Fortunately, Sanjay's experience is extremely rare, occurring less than one in 500,000 pregnancies. Nicholas Fisk is Professor of Obstetrics and Gynaecology at Queen Mary Hospital in London and a world authority on all twin pregnancy complications. Of all those complications of single placenta twins, fetus in feto is by far the rarest, one in hundreds of thousands, so that as a fetal medicine specialist, um, dealing with these single placenta twins, I would hardly ever see it. For every baby, the journey from conception to birth is fraught with dangers, 
And for twins, this journey is the most dangerous of all. Twins have much greater risks than a single pregnancy, and, and it's not just because there are two babies instead of one, it's not twice as high. So for instance, the chance of a baby dying in a twin pregnancy is around three to four percent from the time that pregnancy gets to 24 weeks until the parents would normally take the twins home. It's estimated that as many as one in eight of us started out as twins and may not even know it. Sometimes early on in pregnancy, one twin fetus is reabsorbed by the mother's body. Most never know that what ended up as one baby began as two. But sometimes at birth, doctors can detect the remnant of the former twin, an outline flattened. They call it fetus papyraceus, the paper baby. At other times, the twin does manage to develop, but only partially. There's a really bizarre condition where they share their blood flow, but one of them doesn't develop normally, and it becomes a parasite fed by blood flow from the other one. So one in 35,000 pregnancies, this single placenta twin develops without a heart and without a brain. It's called an acardiac twin. Now, normally, if that was a singleton, that baby would die, but it's kept alive as a parasite without a heart by blood flow from its co-twin, who pumps blood all the way around its circulation as well. But much more common, and every bit as deadly, are problems that affect unborn twins even when both are developing normally. Dangers can arise from the way twins share space in the womb, especially when both twins are growing in the same amniotic sac. And their cords can loop around each other, like a cue or macrame. It's a bit like two kittens with a ball of wool. And then, if that pulls tight, they can die inside the womb. That happens at least 30% of the time with single sac twins. Every twin pregnancy may be a battle in the womb. This rare footage shows one twin punching its sibling. But frequently, it's not just a squabble over space, but a battle over resources. The way twins compete over the blood flow and vital nourishment coming from the mother often leads to the death of one or both unborn twins. But such concerns would never have occurred to Sharon Lever and her husband, Russell, when in January 2003, they were told she was expecting twins. Getting pregnant was something she'd convinced herself would never happen. I'd already decided I wasn't going to have children because I knew that my gynaecological problems were serious enough for me never to be able to conceive. We, we didn't think that it was ever going to happen. Um, and. I think we both resigned our fa ourselves to the fact that it wasn't going to happen and we were just going to continue our life with our dog and, and, that, and, that was, and that was going to be that. If people had babies around me, I would move away because I just didn't want the question, oh, when are you going to have them? Because I was entering that phase in my life where people ask, certainly women and some men, that question. So I was... I didn't want to ever have that conversation with anyone. And then she announced that she was pregnant and I just remember saying that's fantastic, grabbing hold of her and thinking it was absolutely wonderful. To find myself pregnant it was like a page out of a fairy tale. It was amazing. And in the light of all her past problems, the fact that she was now pregnant with twins was even more amazing. Walked in for the viability sort of scan and she said, oh yeah, you're pregnant and do you have twins in your family? So I said, uh, yep. She said, there's definitely twins here. I just checked, there's not another one. It's quite often we miss one if they're hidden behind another one or something. I was like, and at that point, it was just like, okay, right, fine. <laughs> but her pregnancy was far from fine. Although at the time Sharon was unaware, her twin babies were developing a life-threatening condition that could kill them within a matter of weeks. At around um, 12, 13 weeks, started to increase in size, like unbelievably. And I wasn't scanned after 12 weeks until 
I went at, at 15 weeks and said, I, I, I'm in pain, um, which I was. And that was obviously the, the, the amount of fluid. I was enormous. And that's when they identified that I needed to have another scan. And I did at, at um, 16 weeks. I was scanned again. That's when they said, I think you've got twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Twin to twin transfusion syndrome, or TTTS, is a rare but devastating condition that affects as many as one in seven identical twin pregnancies, always when both twins share one placenta, connecting them to the mother's blood supply. There are a number of other problems you can get in twins, but twin-twin transfusion syndrome is the worst, and it's a devastating condition. Without treatment, at least 80% of the babies will die inside the womb or shortly after birth. TTTS is caused by an unequal sharing of blood from the mother's placenta. One twin doesn't get enough blood and can die starved of the nutrients it needs to grow. And the other twin gets too much blood, which can cause it to die from heart failure as it struggles to support its sibling. Twin twins are an absolutely fascinating condition because you've got genetically identical individuals joined by a common resource, the placenta and blood flow, which they compete for. So genetically identical, but exactly the opposite problem, one of blood loss and one of too much blood. But initially, it was hard for Sharon to find much information about TTTS. We go home, you look on the internet, and everyone, practically everyone who writes on the internet about having had twin to twin write because their babies have died. And um, you realise that if you don't do anything about this condition, when you have it and it's severe, um, the babies die or they're born with very, very severe disabilities. So you're, you're suddenly, I don't know, from joy, you're in complete despair, really. Once TTTS had been diagnosed, Sharon urgently needed scans. She was sent to King's College Hospital in London, which specialises in twin pregnancy problems. I spent most of that day being scanned by about five different consultants, heart consultants, brain consultants for the, for the babies, neonatal stuff. The twins were in a bad way. The uneven blood flow had resulted in an uneven amount of fluid in each twin's amniotic sac. By that point, um, twin one had no fluid at all, had lost all fluid. And they described that twin two was as though she was in an, in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. She was just completely drowning in, in fluid. And um, her whole sack had drawn her against the side of the, um, of the womb and she, she'd had it really. She was, she, she was not moving, she had no bladder. She had no, no, no internal system at all really, other than a heart. And uh, she was in dire straits. But actually they said to us that twin two, the one who was in all the fluid was actually the one that would probably go first because their hearts have to work so fast with all the fluid. They said, this is really bad. These babies are in a really bad way. They said that the chances were just, were dire. The only way in which they could possibly give them a chance was to do laser ablation. Laser ablation surgery targets the placenta whilst the babies are still in utero cauterizing blood vessels to try to correct the abnormal blood flow between them. But it's a new and complex procedure, and it's only undertaken in a small number of specialist pregnancy centers. Twenty-year-old Brittany Smith lives in the American state of Mississippi. Last year, her house was destroyed by Hurricane Katrina, and she now lives in a caravan with her husband, Chris. She's also five months pregnant with twins. I was probably about three weeks pregnant. Well, I started bleeding and had went to the emergency room. And that's when I found out I was having twins. They did ultrasound at the hospital. I was bleeding for a couple months and I was going to the doctor like once a week, and you know, 
and he was checking me every week and you know he didn't understand you know what was going on yeah i was really scared <laughs> just as happened to sharon lever Brittany's local doctor diagnosed her with ttts now she's been rushed to a specialist center at the university of north carolina hospital for emergency treatment I just thought it was like a disease, like, you know, like something was really, really wrong with him, and it was. Dr. Anthony Johnson runs the pregnancy clinic here. He explains to Brittany and her family that this is an emergency. If action isn't taken now, the consequences will be disastrous. We will look at a situation where somewhere between 60 to 70 percent of the time, both babies die. And it can be either one. So that ultimately, when you do the math, there's less than a 10% chance of two healthy babies once you get into this cascade. Back at their hostel, Brittany takes a rest as husband Chris absorbs the news that their unborn twins are engaged in a battle to the death inside the womb, and the odds of survival are poor. I just hope that the one I worry about most is when the little one giving all his blood to the big one. Is it, you know, giving all his blood away or the big one having a heart attack for having too much blood, you know? It's the only thing I worry about. Hope that don't happen. Scan after scan follows during the next few days as the babies are closely monitored. With TTTS, a close check is required, as the unborn baby's condition can quickly deteriorate, threatening their lives. The only hope of saving both twins' lives is pioneering laser ablation surgery, which targets blood vessels in the placenta and cauterizes them in order to even out the blood flow between the babies. Telescopic laser surgery for this disease has been a terrific advance and, and made a huge difference. It can completely stop the pathology in its tracks so that both babies recover, the small one grows, reaccumulates its fluid, the big one stops peeing as much, its heart failure reverses, and they both go on and everyone lives happily ever after. Dr. Johnson wants to rush Brittany into laser surgery right away. He fears that the abnormal blood flow is now so bad that either of the twins could die at any time. We're wanting to come out with two babies. And that's the safest one to, you know, to come out with two babies. Well, there's still that chance that we might only yeah. get one. But, but that's you know, we're wanting to try. What's your crown for? Because I can't go through the skin. <laughs> what? Laser surgery is the only hope of saving both unborn twins' lives. But the operation Brittany faces is fraught with risks. Any tiny mistake with the laser can injure the babies or cause bleeding in the placenta, which leads to their sudden death. They have not taken the decision to proceed lightly. Brittany Smith, accompanied by her husband Chris and his mother Frinda, is on her way to hospital for emergency laser ablation surgery on her unborn twins. The laser surgery is the only hope of saving her babies. One is receiving too much blood through the mother's placenta, the other too little. With twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome, also known as TTTS, a single day can make the difference between life and death for the twins. Dr. Johnson has decided Brittany must be rushed into surgery, but first he must explain the risks involved. In, in the event here, we, we've got a pregnancy and we've got a mother, right? In the back room, everything is on her. Okay, so if something goes awry, something that just is unpredictable, that, that can happen, that can happen in any surgery. Um, if we feel that Brittany is in trouble, we won't think twice about delivering this pregnancy. We need to understand that, okay? Things could happen. 
this surgery is certainly not a walk in the park. There, there are substantial risks of losing at least one baby, maybe one in five to one in three of the time. The operation is to be performed under local anaesthetic. The point of the laser is less than six millimeters across and is introduced down a tube. A screen allows the surgeons to see the tiny blood vessels they're aiming at. They have to line up the laser before firing it and cauterizing the blood vessels closed. Pinpoint accuracy is crucial. One false blast of the laser could injure the babies, tear through the placenta and cause both babies to bleed to death. Dr. Johnson and his team begin working to identify the blood vessels and blast them one by one to cauterize them. The red light on the screen shows where they're aiming. Brittany has to hold herself completely still whilst they target and fire the laser. Breath for us. Hold it, hold it, hold it. The surgery is supposed to last about half an hour, but after nearly two hours, Dr. Johnson and his team are still operating. Brittany's twins are lying awkwardly, and it's hard for the laser to reach all the blood vessels they need to seal. Worse, every time they fire the laser, a small amount of blood escapes into the womb, clouding the fluid there and making it harder and harder to see. Give me some fluid, please. Just Two and a half hours after the operation began, Dr. Johnson decides he's done all he can. Taking it out. Taking it out. Stop. Stop the injection. Brittany is wheeled into recovery. She's had a bad reaction to the local anaesthetic and is cold and exhausted. Dr. Johnson, yes, if everything goes good, how long will you expect to keep them? Um, she'll be here for at least 48 hours. Okay, and the first 24 is going to be the most... 48 hours. They're, they're going to watch her for 48 hours, and the first 24 hours is going to be critical. The worst thing is that nobody knows if the operation is a success. Everyone must wait and see if the laser surgery has cauterized enough of the blood vessels in the placenta to stop the blood flow between the twins. Later on that day, Dr. Johnson breaks the news to Brittany that the operation wasn't as straightforward as they'd hoped. What happened was, the way the baby was laying, um, he was laying across the body of the placenta, okay? So we would turn you from side to side to try and get the big one to roll off. So we tried to go across, and when we went across, as long as we were going across the chest, it's fine, but when we went across here, across the neck, you push here on these vessels, and the baby didn't like that. And his heart rate went down. And then we stopped, and it came back up. Tomorrow morning for us is going to be critical to see what the babies do. Do they sustain the process? But tomorrow morning is going to be the most critical time for us. Only then will Dr. Johnson be able to judge if the laser surgery has worked. And the uncertainty is taking its toll on the young mother. I'm depressed, scared, you know, not knowing what to expect more, and hopefully everything will be okay. Like Brittany, Sharon Lever had to undergo the same laser surgery for TTTS. For her, the operation was also fraught with risks. He said to, he said to us that because of where, where the placenta is lying, they say there's about a 33% you know, chance that the one baby will survive, a 33% chance that two babies will survive. That's of the, when you have the surgery done. And 
33% chance that both will die. Well, those, those odds were reduced for us because of where the placenta was lying. And he kept saying to us, are you sure you're only those weeks pregnant? Because this is very, very severe. And I don't think they're going to make it. So, sorry. So anyway, it was pretty, um, pretty hideous, really. There are lots of people there. Nurses are flying into rooms saying that um, a, um, the baby in the next treatment room has just died. You know, it, it's, it's, it's completely, it's completely um, chaotic. And so you just kind of remain a little bit, you just feel very small and, and allow people to do whatever they need to do to you. The operation was performed under local anaesthetic. And then um, he had to put like a, um, like a knitting needle in to create the hole, which then he managed to somehow, it just went in just over the head of twin one into the sack of twin two. And then he said, I've got to find the, the vessel. And of course, obviously, you've got a camera in there. So you can see the baby, you can see twin two swimming around in all this water and looking like having a great time. And uh, it was, it was, <laughs> it was kind of beautiful, but kind of ghoulish as well to see them. But he then put the laser in and then he um, managed to identify the connecting vessel. And then he just gradually lasered or burnt out that vessel. Once the laser was withdrawn, the excess fluid from the bloated sack of twin two gushed out and the balance between the twins rapidly leveled out. They left us for an hour to check whether I had any contractions. Um, thankfully I didn't. Um, I came back in to the room to be scanned again. They scanned me and said, this is fantastic. The, the twin one was moving, which she hadn't moved once during the scanning before. She was moving and she'd got fluid around her and she'd got a tiny, tiny bladder, speck of a bladder. So it meant that her body was working again and that twin two, who had, had previously been completely covered in fluid and drowning, was now in a normal size sack and her, the fluid levels were perfect. Um, so we left the hospital then at about 10 o'clock, got in a cab and went home. It's now 36 hours since Brittany's laser surgery and the results are much less positive for her than they were for Sharon. Dr. Johnson comes to break the news that she faces losing at least one of her babies. It's a situation where we see one is becoming sicker. Options and treatment at this point in time really are, are, are somewhat limited. You're now 23 weeks in a, in a, in a couple of days, all right? Um, for twin-twin transfusion delivery at this point in time, that would be a death sentence, quite frankly. Another option, which is, I know not something that you want to entertain, but something we just need to discuss is, is the possibility that if this is persistent to try and save one to reduce the pregnancy. I'm not looking for an answer. It may be an option that could at least get you one healthy baby out of this. I just want you to know that you are working miracles for people. <laughs> and That's keep your head up. Awesome. Call me if you need something. Here on okay? It's a tragic situation. The only chance of saving either of Brittany's babies is to accept the termination of one of them in the hope of keeping the other one alive. Her only other course of action would be to wait and see which baby will die and risk both miscarrying. It's too late for any more laser surgery. In advanced stage disease, the primary treatment is by telescopic laser to, to correct the underlying problem. There is an alternative that people have used for severe disease, which is to occlude the umbilical cord of one of the babies. Now that means that that baby dies, and that's done in an attempt to rescue the other baby, so that that death, albeit unfortunate, will not impinge on the health of the surviving baby, so that at least the pregnancy will go on and lead to a healthy singleton. The laser surgery failed to cut off enough of the blood vessels flowing between the unborn twins. And now Dr. Johnson doesn't think he can make another attempt. 
we do not want to subject Brittany to a procedure if we know it won't work. I mean, we, we almost like protecting the patient against itself. This is a bad disease. Brittany spends all night agonizing over whether to terminate one baby in an attempt to save the other. In the morning, Dr. Johnson performs another scan to check how the twins are progressing. Quickly, it's clear the decision has been made for her. The choice of which baby to terminate has been taken out of their hands. You've probably noticed that we haven't imaged the, the, big, the big baby. Um, we actually did image the big baby as, as soon as I sat down. There's no heartbeat in the larger fetus. There is no cardiac activity at all. As devastating as the news is, there's optimism for the surviving twin. The heart looks good on the survivor, and the blood flow in the cord says we may have a, a, a good shot at this. So we'll scan her again later today, and what we see then, we'll make a decision about where we go from there. With TTTS, it's not unusual for both twins to die in quick succession, as when one dies, the other's heart can't cope with the change in blood flow. But when Brittany is scanned again a few hours later, there's good news for her. Although the bigger of her two twins has died, the smaller twin with the weaker heart is now receiving a normal blood flow and is progressing well. It's fine. OK. I think so. All right, you're heading home. I think that, quite frankly, we're as good as we're going to get. I don't think you need to come back here. I mean, we, we definitely want to know what's going on. We definitely want to know what's happening with the baby, and not just the pregnancy, but we will be in touch with you for weeks and months and years down the road. Take care of yourself, all right? All right. Be well. Thanks, sir. All right. Thank Tell the family you. I said goodbye. So <laughs> Thank Take care of yourself, all right? All right, see you. Pretty. Hey. The Smiths leave UNC Hospital for the last time. The dead twin is left inside Brittany because any surgery to remove it risks breaking the amniotic sac and killing the surviving baby. A few weeks later, Brittany Smith's surviving baby, Ian, was delivered, weeks premature. This home video was taken just minutes after his birth. Ian was only 12 inches long but he'd been showing signs of heart failure and doctors felt they had no choice but to rush him into the world. It was sad to see him hooked up to everything and have IVs and cords going through his belly button and him being so small, but I was excited that he was fine. I seen him moving, so counting his toes and his fingers and everything looked good, so. It's a week after Ian was born, and this is the first time Brittany has been allowed to hold her son. Up until now, he's been too weak and vulnerable to infection for even his mother to touch him. But now, despite having been born so early, baby Ian is doing well, and everyone's full of hope for the future. He's doing great. He's doing great. He's breathing on his own, he's crying. He smiled the other day. A few miles from the hospital is the grave of Ian's dead brother, Isaac. Brittany and Chris buried him two days after Ian's birth. When you find out you're having twins, you know, and you deliver, you're going to come out with two babies. You just come out, you know, I just came out with one baby because I've been through so much of this pregnancy. I have two babies, but, you know, we tried, but that's okay, though. He's in a better place.
Tragically, just three weeks after his birth, baby Ian passed away as well. This was the horrifying prospect that faced Sharon Lever a few days after leaving hospital. In only her 21st week of pregnancy, her water started to break and the doctor told her she'd have to deliver the baby straight away. And his exact words were, I'm afraid that's it, it's over. You're gonna have to have a, what amounts to a termination. When Sharon Lever's water started to break 18 weeks into her pregnancy, following laser surgery for twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome, she was told she might have to terminate her pregnancy. I don't really know what made me want to not do it that night. I just, I think it was that I felt it was, it was too quickly after the operation. I felt like I wasn't ready to see them. Because obviously you have to actually give birth to them and I, was, I just wasn't ready for that. And I, I think also because he felt that they would probably be, have died by the morning, I, I didn't want to give birth to them live and let them die afterwards. I wanted them to, I wanted to give birth. To, and it sounds, it sounds odd, but if I had to choose, that would be better, that I knew they'd already gone. It was a really horrible night, but a really odd thing happened because I, it was the first night I felt them move. Miraculously, the baby survived the night and held on for the next 13 weeks. Sharon's waters repeatedly broke, but there was just enough amniotic fluid to sustain the baby's lives. Although the fluid was reduced, um, it was enough to sustain the pregnancies. In between each scan, and as you, you know, you were wishing, wishing the weeks away, to get to sort of the landmark 22, 23 weeks, it just, um, it was like slow motion. Couldn't get there quick enough, really. At 31 weeks, I started to lose blood and um, I went into hospital and they scanned me and they said they were both fine. But the same consultant again came in to see me and he said, I think, I think these babies have now, they've given us too many signs that it's, it's not viable any longer to hold on to them, for you to hold on to them, we're gonna to have to deliver them. I'm, this was on the Friday, and he said I'd deliver them on, on the Monday. The babies were born by caesarean, about 1.15. 1.13 and 1.15, on, um, on the 24th of November, 2003. They were baby girls, and Sharon and Russell named them Hope and Esme. Esme means my beloved. They looked pretty small and they looked pretty delicate, um, but they screamed as soon as they came out. And uh, I was taken into recovery and Russ went off to special care to go and see them and take some photos of them. The um, midwife came in and said, would you like to come and see your babies? And I said, yeah, I was absolutely gagging to get down there. I couldn't, I couldn't wait. Um, they will be down there. and. Uh, they were just sort of lying there and you could see their little chest breathing and everything and I could touch them, it was brilliant. But the, um, we had named them the night that we thought we'd lost, you know, that we were told that they had died or they would die. We had named them, but we decided not to use those names. We decided to rename them when they were born um, because we felt that in some way those babies weren't the same babies that made it through. Now, Hope and Esme are nearly three years old. Healthy, happy, and full of life. Well done. Ooh! Just one at a time, one, one big, one medium sized one at a time. They're very lovely, chatty, sweet, noisy, difficult to handle sometimes, to a something year old children, you know, they're, they're, I think they're pretty normal, which is what all I really wanted. Sharon knows that she is one of the lucky ones, 
and that there are many other mothers who lose one or both of their babies to TTTS. Twenty Twin nearly took them away from me, took them away from us. This problem of twin twin transfusion syndrome is the greatest challenge we face today in fetal therapy. Why? Because it's not just one baby, there are two. Because these babies are entirely structurally normal. Unlike all the other problems we try and deal with where there are already problems inside the babies, here the problem is in the placenta. And thirdly, the outcome is so devastating if you don't do anything about it. They are precious beyond beyond words really. They were a real joy to be around and I love them very much. Time has healed and only they have done that really. Only the girls have done that. Um, and yes, it was definitely worth it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it at all. about to start all five